just a terrible business to be in, right? You uh, booked a very big billboard in Leicester Square over a certain GB News. Um, Lawrence Fox basically had this whole thing about how we'd, we'd never buy car and coffee again. It's just an absolute dog of a business. Mm -hmm. Unless we could kind of drag people by the ear to one of nine locations, there was basically no way for us to make any money. Mm -hmm. So 29,000 aluminium, plastic aluminium pods go into landfill every minute. A scuffle with Nespresso recently. Our respective lawyers exchanging some, some letters. We always wanted to scale this bigger than we thought, than our 500 pounds a month Facebook account. 1.3 million. 1.2.7 million and then I think we did 10 grand of revenue in January 2020 and I think we did half a million in March like Boris on TV doing his like you should not be meeting friends thing by the Thursday I mean, it was effectively all over right we would we were down 80 or 90 percent people were leaving London it's supposed to be a matter of survival really mm -hmm. like and that, that was the worst week of my life welcome to episode four of Charl Chats, the e-commerce podcast. My name's Nick. I'm the founder of Charl, a Shopify agency here in London. And I'm so excited to welcome you to our home for some very open, honest, and real conversations with some absolute A players in e-commerce right now. I am so excited for today's guest. So without further ado, let's do this. Welcome, Teddy, Andre, to episode four of Child Chat's e-commerce podcast. I'm so excited to have you both. Teddy, obviously everybody knows you, but for those who don't, do you want to just give us a quick intro of who you are and, and what you do? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Teddy Robinson. I'm the CMO of Grind. Uh, we're a coffee company that lives in London. So we've had cafes around the city for 12 years now. And we've more recently, we've kind of pivoted into e-commerce. So we're now mostly an e-commerce business selling compostable Nespresso pods online. I'm so excited for this conversation. We are, Charlie is an absolute subscriber to Grind Coffee Pods. So I'm Great. so <laughs> excited to be diving in. Andre, obviously you've been on a number of our podcasts now, but for anyone that's just tuned into this episode, Give us a quick intro. Of course. So I'm Andre. I'm the new business manager at Charles. So it's my absolute pleasure to manage all of the sales operations for the agency. And yeah, it's a delight to be here again, Nick. Ready to absolutely smash episode four. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do this. So, Teddy, I mean, as much as I want to talk to Andre, I want to know all about Grind. Sorry, Andre. <laughs> yes. So should we start off with just like a little bit of the story of Grind coffee. Yeah, totally. So we've we started serving coffee in London in 2011. So the founder David, he his dad had a mobile phone shop, and then when his dad sadly passed away, David was left with this strange round building on Old Street Roundabout in Shoreditch, and had kind of always talked with his dad about making it into a cafe, and then did. Um, so that was back in 2011. So. Shoreditch back then was kind of very different, and to be honest, coffee in London was also very very different then. Um, but yeah, actually, that was my that was where I started the, in the business. So this, this was ten years ago now, and I was I was a student. I basically needed like a Saturday job, and I still started working, basically washing dishes in the Grind Cafe. In so the you first are literally one. one of the OGs. Oh yeah, oh, amazing. So like, I love this. <laughs> it was a very different business then. So at the time, we only had like six or seven employees, and it was a, I mean, it was a very like it was very rock and roll. Um, yeah, quite a lot of just like. There were a few people there. Some of them lived in there some of the time. It was very like, I mean, Shoreditch was a really different place. Then, yeah. right? It was kind of, I think Shoreditch House had just opened there. And it was the first kind of the, the round of agencies had been kind of moving into the area. But it was very much before the whole Silicon Roundabout kind of tech community had arrived in that whole area. Um, but yeah, so we, um, the business grew then over a, over the next kind of five years. Um, kind of had rounds and rounds of growth. So we had... We raised quite a lot of money from, through crowdfunding. So we raised kind of three crowdfunding rounds, 2015, 2017, 2019, doing 1.3 million, 1.2.7 million. And then, yeah, I think, I think that was that one. Yeah, and then we, but yeah, so to be honest, my role developed quite quickly from, I mean, after about six months, it was quite clear that I wasn't very good at washing dishes. <laughs> and we had this insane conversation, which obviously sounds ridiculous now where we were like, okay, we've got this cafe. Maybe we should start an Instagram account for our cafe, which at the time was a, a revelatory idea. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, so I very quickly kind of took on a kind of brand role within the business and then developed that. Obviously, the fact that although we were always a coffee shop, we were always quite a digital business. So we had a, always had a kind of, we invested in like digital loyalty quite early on. We we're always doing quite a lot of data capture, which then, then fed things like our crowdfunding. And I'd say that crowdfunding for us was probably my first experience of like, I guess, digital marketing in the way that we talk about it today in terms of bringing people over to the website and feeding them with information, hopefully having some of the money go from them, their pockets to our pockets. Um, so yeah, so we, so we raised, for about, we, had, we had about four and a half thousand investors over those three crowdfunding raise. Most of those now have now actually come out of the business have made a return on that investment. But yeah, that was, that was kind of the growth story for us pre-COVID. I, I love the story of Grime because I remember when I was a bit younger and I'd literally go to your cafes and I'd just be like, this looks amazing. They feel very Instagrammable by nature. You know, you just feel like you want to start taking pictures. Uh, and the experience was always something. I was like, this is not like every every other cafe. So why do you think, like, obviously, there's a lot of coffee shops in London, right? Why do you think that Grind was able to kind of like really slice through that competition and be seen really as a as a brand rather than, oh, it's just a nice hipster Shoreditch coffee shop, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we we kind of, I think there was a really, um, so the journey of coffee shops in, Lo in London in the, maybe the last 10 years has been quite interesting because there was a point where they all had this very specific kind of hipster identity of like, it'd be like a guys with like tattoos and beards on their like, that, that very kind of classic hipster idea mm -hmm. we all have. And that there was this real version of this at the time where the, the, the coffee was, was so important to these people and the product was so important to them that actually the cafes themselves would often look a bit like, like kind of ramshackle. So mm -hmm. people would be, and we kind of looked at that even very early on and we kind of wanted, we realized we wanted to have a place that people would be able to spend kind of at least a more reasonable amount of time, sit somewhere a bit more comfortable. And also we just liked the idea of making spaces that looked good. Um, I think that like, it's quite funny now. It's in the whole kind of, the idea of things being Instagrammable is I think a bit of a dirty word now. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, the idea that we were, to some extent, considering that, even if it wasn't the primary thing, what primary purpose of what we were doing, but the fact that we were considering that when we were making these spaces, I think set us apart. Mm -hmm. um, also, I mean, to be honest, it's kind of a matter of just being the longest, like just, it's supposed to be a matter of survival, mm -hmm. really. Like serving coffee, serving a three pound, three pound 50 product while paying 150 pounds, 550,000 pounds of commercial rents in a year, it's just like, just, a terrible business to be in, right? It's just like, it's just a absolute dog of a business mm -hmm. and that it requires a huge amount of passion. It's incredibly people intensive. It's incredibly cash intensive. And then I think even the, even for businesses that were doing really well, COVID then happened. And then that was a whole other, whole new challenge for businesses like that. So in the kind of journey of, of grind, obviously the cafes came first when was it that e-commerce started really becoming important? Because I know that you've opened up quite a lot of other cafes around London. Yeah. And I've seen pop-ups like Batty Power Station, for example, Soho Farmhouse. Um, when was it that e-commerce started becoming like, oh, actually, I think we really need to get online? Yes, yeah, so I think we'd always, always had this kind of brand first idea about everything that we were doing. And then in probably, probably like 2018 or so, I think there was this realisation that like, the business that we had on the high street was really difficult, right? And we had this, we had a, an interesting set of, we had, a, we had this really kind of interesting set of expertise in the business where we had all these people who were so smart, we were roasting all this coffee ourselves. And yeah, at the time we were kind of selling it in like bags in the stores, but we had this, we realized that to some extent we were in a business where that unless we could kind of drag people by the ear to one of nine physical locations, there was basically no way for us to make any money. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the same time, we had this great demand for like, people would be asking us if like they could buy tote bags or they could buy t-shirts or they'd ask to buy the staff's t-shirts. And we were like, there's obviously an opportunity for this here. At the same time, I think that we also realized that we were, we were making some really, really good coffee. Mm -hmm. And we were thought it would just be, it would make a lot of sense to put up a, even a very basic Shopify store like we did at the beginning. Um, and then once we then explored that idea, we then kind of uncovered this Nespresso pods thing, mm -hmm. which, for, for for us came in the it came in the form of just kind of discovering how bad Nespresso pods were, mm -hmm. not only in terms of the product themselves, but actually in terms of just all the kind of environmental factors. And then that all of a sudden really gave that uh, what at the time was a kind of a little side project. It really gave it a lot of purpose. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think we were. I mean, look, we were. I think the like the idea 
it's great for it's great for us now that we we'll be able to look look back on these things and look at the time when we bought. Are we spending kind of I don't know hundreds of thousands of pounds of machines to be able to put the pods into tins and that felt like such an incredible kind of punt at the time it was such like a moonshot for us and it looks really great in retrospect but in reality like lockdown happening i mean if that if that if our machine had come off the boat from germany two weeks later we wouldn't have got it in time for lockdown we wouldn't be sat here doing what we're doing today and we may not even have the rest of the business may not even survive to that period i think it's it's amazing to see how far you guys have come over what feels like a short period of time, really, in terms of A, seeing you on the high street, B, seeing you guys in some really well-known establishments like Soho House, seeing you in supermarkets, for example, and then seeing you guys on like the tube and buses. And I think it's, it's like one of those real passionate London brands that I feel like a lot of Londoners can really get behind. Now I'm going to dive into a bit more about grind as a business a little bit later on. But what I'd love to understand is your role now in the business from cleaning the dishes to yeah. what you do now. Does David still get you to clean the odd cup every now and then? I mean, to, to us, it, was, it was quite clear early on that we, no, we finally bought a dishwasher, I suppose. <laughs> um, we, uh, but it was quite, I think that like I... I went on. A, I mean, I've been on the whole journey with the business, which has been really exciting. But yeah, we um, we had a, we've been on a kind of a, I mean, as the business has grown, my role has kind of developed in that. So I think, but also I think that to some extent, the DTC business today kind of fell out of the brand in terms of the brand that I'd been working on for all of these all of these years. Although it was never really the plan, it was kind of it kind of one did fall out of the other. And it's actually really only been in the last year where in terms of the, my teams that I work with in the business, we've kind of broken out what is basically the D to C team or an e-commerce team from what is kind of just the overall business as a brand team. Mm -hmm. In the, the area of, of my area of the business has now kind of expanded sufficiently that like there are kind of subsets of the business within it, which is really exciting. But yeah, I think like we, today I'm, I mean, I have, I, have a, I have a number of people who I kind of directly, who directly report to me, kind of looking after brand, looking after kind of e-commerce and marketing. And then I also am just kind of involved with various other things mm -hmm. across the business. So I work, I work a lot with, at the moment we're working a lot on our canned, canned coffees that we've been, that we've launched earlier this year. They're kind of, they've gone into some supermarkets. We've got a few more that are rolling out over late this year and early next year, kind of looking at the potential kind of plans for like the international expansion of the business to put on, to hopefully kind of get set up at least with a more, even a limited e-commerce offering internationally and just kind of other projects. But yeah, I'd say my bread and butter is still very much brand, design, marketing, e-commerce, all of that stuff, which is yeah, a lot. Yeah, it's interesting with the team structure as well, just from sort of speaking to merchants, like you mentioned e-commerce and marketing, various different people that you work with. I find some merchants don't have e-commerce people and an e-commerce tends yeah. to sit within marketing, so they won't have an e-commerce manager or an e-com director or even an e-com exec. Yeah. So do you, do you have those roles specifically or does kind of everything sit within marketing? Yeah, it's a funny one because I think like, I think that we, we've got a lot of, I think because of the fact that the e-commerce for us almost, it kind of just fell off out of the, what was kind of the marketing function for a bunch of cafes. We've got this, We've had that. We've gone. We've gone through such an interesting kind of journey with it, and that has then actually shaped the business as it is today quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I think so. I think we, so. We would have. I mean, I think that certainly the two teams, the team within e-commerce and marketing, are certainly very. I mean, they're they're certainly joined at the hip. Yeah. Right? I think of that, course. especially within people, I mean, especially with things things like product development. Mm. But yeah, I think that like the idea that there is a kind of a funnel and that there is a the very bottom of the funnel is ultimately kind of e-commerce and bringing people onto the website yeah. and converting them there. I think the, they are naturally quite connected. Mm -hmm. And I think that, especially over the kind of the testing we've done over the last couple of years, I think we've found acquisition is even maybe more so than it used to be a massive factor in things like, in actually things that we would traditionally think of being like e-commerce terms, like things like, I mean, even, I mean, things like AOV, we find that your AOV process begins on Facebook or it begins mm -hmm. at the kind of on and at yeah. the creative and works backward. And of course, things like subscription are even more kind of entangled up in that kind of stuff. Mm. And obviously your role is really diverse by the sounds of it. You know, you're managing a business that has many prongs to it effectively. How do you have discipline with your time to kind of go, right, I know we need to keep 
keep the tap on with e-com and obviously you've got your dedicated teams that yeah. are looking after each part but i know i would find it really difficult especially if as you've been there from the beginning yeah to not i imagine it's hard to not get too deep on, on everything otherwise you end up turning the tap on one area and turn it off somewhere else yeah i mean i think we've got i've got the people who work, work with really closely are brilliant and in many ways i mean in very explicit ways, much more experienced in these things than I am, right? I think this is like, I mean, we kind of, we went through a period maybe about two years ago where we brought in a lot of really, really talented people who've been through this journey many times over. And in a lot of ways, I find that even kind of as a manager and working with a team, like a lot of parts of the, a lot of the parts of this team kind of run themselves. So which leaves me in a position where I can kind of make rather necessarily being there pedaling the bike, mm -hmm. I'm able to kind of make interventions at points that I, where we find things are appropriate or I find that like there's an opportunity where I think that something could be done better or things and that can, it's, look, it's, I'm really lucky to be in a role where, where it's kind of strategic and I get to kind of bring my whole self to it, which I think that I'm really lucky to be in. Oh, that's, that is the dream. I imagine it's still hard not to... Oh, not yeah. Want to believe it. Well, I know what I'm like. Speaking from experience, eh, I Nick? speak from yeah. experience. Oh, yeah. as, as you start to step back more and you're like, oh, I, I need to get in here. I need to jump yeah. in here. I think with the creative... I mean, there's that thing of like, like I can't... I don't remember the last time that I didn't have like Photoshop. Like, like I, I will happily like... I love making stuff, yeah. right? I think like... And the, okay, and it's occasionally it's kind of like I have to have these little battles where someone's like, hey, like... Someone's like, please, can you stop, like, can you just, like, stop logging into the, can you stop going in the Shopify theme? Yeah. And, like, and, like, and like, like, Emma, her, her, like, head of e-commerce, she's like, hates me going to Shopify theme. She hates it. And I'm just there, like, I want to go in and just, like, change stuff. <laughs> but then at some point, you're kind of just, like, you are just, like, and then one other person playing Jenga on yeah. the yeah. various stack of other things going on. Yeah, and I think I think it's really, you act like you're so calm about it. Honestly, it's amazing. You guys are doing so many things. I'm like... God, you must you must have a busy day. Like, I mean, it's just really good fun, right? I mean, it's yeah. like really like it's really exciting to have these things going on. And like, yeah, like I think I kind of I'll have meetings with David, our CEO, and Dan, our CFO, mm -hmm. and like our, the list of stuff that we have is just wild, right? In terms of just like the, the the breadth of the business. I mean, not to mention that there's all this stuff going on, and then we've kind of got this like we've got also got this like restaurant business slash restaurant slash that employs another like 300 people on the side so i mean it's like the breadth of the business is really really exciting i mean certainly we've got quite a lot of like irons in the fire for the future mm -hmm. but yeah it's quite it's look definitely it's never a slow day <laughs> yeah. i love it i love it i can tell it's not a slow day because you guys always seem to be doing your next thing which is really exciting so let's go back to ecom as this is the e-commerce podcast um the compostable pod so where did this come from? Like, where did the idea start? Because it's not something you I've really seen before until I saw you guys. So give us a little bit of the backstory on where this originated from. Yeah. So like, I think like, I think there's probably an idea of this where like, I think you see it a lot on kind of like founder stories and things. It's like the idea that at some point, like someone went on like an ayahuasca, like vision quest and was like, <laughs> this is it, compostable coffee pods. But I do think that like to some extent, this was something that we were, we were we were looking at coffee itself, right? And just being a bit like, hey, look, like, like how can we like how can we make our coffee e-commerce better? Mm -hmm. And coffee is a really, really difficult product to differentiate in. It's like if you go into a supermarket or even I mean even just on a high street, without even going anything particularly specialty, you can spend between 10 pounds and about 40 pounds on like a kilo of coffee. And probably even more so than something like wine, which I guess would be a kind of a comparable product category. You like know, not know, it's really difficult to tell the difference, right? Or like, the, and, the, and the difference in terms of the product quality is probably not that large mm -hmm. in the space of that 10, 10 to 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, there are a lot of other things. I mean, a lot of the time you're paying for a much better kind of ethical level of trading and you're better, paying for better conditions on the, on the lives of the farmers, which are really important. But I think that people, but consumers just kind of, it's difficult to communicate why this coffee is that much better to them. Mm -hmm. And if you can't communicate it, then it might as well not be that much better. So when we, when we were looking at pods, we looked, obviously, this Nespresso are an incredible business, right? It's basically, one in three, one in three houses in the UK has an espresso machine. Nine out of 10 Grind customers before they come to Grind will already have an espresso machine. Nespresso have built the rails of this, right? Mm -hmm. And they sell a huge amount of them. They're 
is a very clean, well-run brand. They've got they paid George Clooney fifty million dollars over <laughs> time ever. Like they are, they know exactly what they're doing, and they're very they're very careful. They're very considered with it, um, and they've done a really good job building the rails of it. So, however, the aluminium pods that they use are just like incredibly wasteful. I mean, it's, it's crazy if you think about the kind of the, the move that we've seen. And I, I think a lot of the, I think a lot of kind of sustainability things happens in these like big waves where there was a point in maybe like 2017 where plastic bottles just disappeared from offices completely. And everyone had those like, and they were the Chili's bottles back yeah. then. I know, just I know the Chili's guys quite well, but yeah. And things like people having kind of tote bags or people having the, I mean, the plastic straws Thing is the craziest one of that like yeah. there was the one video of like the turtle and then that was it like like we had we had like suppliers to our cafes were emailing us like for the first time ever and being like yeah we're literally not going to sell you these anymore we're not even going to stock them and this is a company that probably will still sell you a, a polystyrene burger thing mm -hmm. if you want one and so yeah like we, we um it, the waste of them is crazy so twenty nine thousand aluminium plastic or aluminium pods go into landfill every minute which is just like a it's one of those things where I can tell you what six pods looks like. I can't tell you what 30,000 no, pods look like. It's just a it. kind of, I don't know how many, it's probably the size of this room in mm -hmm. terms of just the volume of this shit that is just thrown into landfill every, that that's thrown into landfill every minute. And aluminium in itself is a bit of a, a mixed bag um, in terms of its sustainability credentials in that it's great in that you can be reused and a lot of it does get reused. However, actually like extracting it is a really horrible process like one to two percent of all energy in the used in the world every day is used is using an aluminium refinement. It just feels like something that like if you're going to sit there and make yourself a coffee in the morning, you're going to go and throw a piece of metal in the bin for every coffee you make. Sometimes two if you're making a really strong coffee. Mm -hmm. It just felt unsustainable. And yet yeah, to make a pod that is compostable. But even then, I mean, even the ones that we launched with in back in 2019 were are very different from the ones we've got today. So we're probably on era four or five of just simply using a different substrate to make these pods. But yeah, so our current pods are home compostable. So you better throw them into your garden or into even in your bin and they will just disappear in three to six months, which is probably about the same time as like a banana peel. That's, I think, I think that's amazing that you guys have literally like tapped into, it, it seems really obvious that this is just terrible that we are literally throwing this stuff away every day. And I think, I always, I always used to wonder this with like recycling and, and, and things where like we assume things like glass and cans yeah. are just, oh, they're so easy to recycle. But I don't think anybody really has the education on what that process actually looks like every time I throw a Coke can in the bin or when, when I throw a glass bottle away. I think that the actual knowledge that possibly the general public have on that process after the fact that we've associated that material being we in a good material is probably quite limited and yeah i think before before you know the movement of pods being terrible we are, um I've seen a few kind of conversations about this. I would have thought, oh, it's metal, it's easy to recycle and great, I can just keep putting in the recycling bin and, and happy days. So I think it's really interesting. But I'm, I imagine that was quite a challenge to actually educate. I think nowadays everybody pretty knows that pods are pretty bad. But I imagine if we f go back maybe back to 2019, yeah. did you find that there was maybe an education piece that you guys had to get people up to scratch with? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that for us, like, I mean, e-commerce and the website in terms of somewhere where we could deliver information to some extent, unfortunately, at scale, in terms of you have to deliver quite a lot of it to people, was always a really big part of that. I think that, like, I don't think people are still kind of figured it out yet. I think that there's a, there are, an, there's an interesting kind of development going on. And I think that there's a, even with things, even, I think there's a, even within kind of greenwashing, there's an idea now that people can just make things complicated, right? Mm -hmm. So recently we've had we've had a bit of a kind of a, a scuffle with Nespresso recently over some kind of exchanging some, well, our respective lawyers ex exchanging some, some letters. And it's been really interesting, the level to which that it feels that they can kind of just like obfuscate where they can just go, hey, look, Aluminium, the, the sustainability of aluminium is complicated because it's about how, okay, can it be recycled? Yes, actually Nespresso, Nespresso have a really good program for going and collecting the pods. People just don't use it. Like mm -hmm. people, and, the, and even then, the, like even in terms of their measurement of it, they're putting, that's another car on the road every day or a van going around London collecting little bags of 
pods that have to be cleaned and separated and washed. And it feels to me that like Nespresso pods as a way to make coffee, which are an incredibly efficient way of making coffee, by the way. So it's like you can make an espresso coffee with about a third of the coffee you might otherwise be using. And they're a great piece of kind of coffee technology. But then the idea that you're going to be someone who wants that level of convenience in terms of making coffee. However, afterwards, you don't mind peeling a little foil cap off and running it under the tap and then putting it in its little bag and then going onto the website and check and making sure that there's a collection coming to you. Make sure that you're going to be in when there's a collection coming. Like, like who's doing who's like, got that? Time? Who's doing this? Like, <laughs> like, 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 oh, are you? <laughs> I didn't even know you were supposed to wash them, so I'm just yeah. going to put my hands up. I'm just like, and, then, and there's a van, like someone today is in a van, in a probably a diesel or petrol van driving around London, collecting these tiny little things so as to drive them off to somewhere else so they can be melted back and then made into new Nespresso pods, which even then have to be made with 70%, it can only be made with 70% recycled and need a bunch of new new metal in there. It's like- It more it just, than cancels it out. Oh, you know, yeah, the amount of energy like, needed for that yeah, process. Like, their kind of argument has always been like, oh, look, it's complicated, right? But like, yeah, look, these things are complicated, right? There's like, there's absolutely, there is a cost to, there are all of these things. I mean, like the, the coffee moving around the world in itself is, I mean, to some extent, the most sustainable thing you can do in almost every corner of your life is to do nothing at all, right? Don't, don't simply don't leave the house. And you're like, and it's, but people like aren't going to be willing deal. to do that. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> and, and we just, yeah. And we just need to like, I, don't, I think there's just an, an opportunity there. People are looking for simple fixes a lot of the time. And I think that communicating that and to some extent educating people on that is, is a challenge, but also a kind of a, a necessary part of this. I think to some extent people aren't really necessary, aren't looking to maybe go and make the investigation sustainability that they maybe need to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's also a, for us in terms of even within our marketing, like the shock factor goes pretty well, right? Like that 29,000 pods of number, it's just, it's just absurd, right? And that's something that we can all kind of empathize with in that way of seeing your tortoise with a straw in its nose and go, yeah, that, that, look, that looks, doesn't look too good of a deal. We should probably do less of this. So let's just take it back to when you launched the site. So I'm guessing this is like pre-pods um, yeah, so and maybe more merch. Was that, is that fair? Yeah, I mean, like, oh God, I mean, like our first venture into, into e-commerce is like, I mean, I've, probably if you look at the Grind website on like, in like 2018, it's probably like a, it's probably a Squarespace website. Love it. Which is, which is great. I mean, real, real optimizing going yeah, on there. Yeah, I love a bit of a Squarespace um, site. And yeah, so we're probably <laughs> running it on Squarespace and we're probably like, we're probably selling bags of coffee that that like there's, that there's a guy in Shoreditch who is like, that he's like, he's making a coffee. He's probably like, he puts the coffee roast on, leaves it for 20 minutes, just like goes outside and does some like, does some skateboards around for a bit. <laughs> he like, and then he comes back and he puts it into some pouches and like, and then that was kind of, that was probably the journey that we went on. I think that we, when we developed pods, we suddenly, that was probably the point where we were like, okay, like, let's, we need to take this a bit more seriously. Let's, uh, let's find an agency to build us a website at the time i think it was obviously the point where like there were there were it felt like there were the first round of the kind of the big e-commerce like ipos were coming out so it felt like brands like shopify or the tools that were out there were for, were really at a point where they're like people had been on this journey mm -hmm. and it felt like there were like businesses that you could kind of just go hey look like this i mean i think by 20 probably over 2018, 2019, there was the emergence of like a playbook for these things, for mm -hmm. e-commerce businesses, especially within Shopify and the Shopify kind of ecosystem. And how did you acquire customers at the very beginning? Oh yeah, I mean like, I was looking at this the other day actually on, on like in terms of how we were doing this, because I think at the time we were, we moved into Shopify in probably in 2019. And I think over, I mean, I've got to say back then there's like, there's at this point, there is no, e-commerce team. This is like myself and David, like in like evenings and weekends around mm -hmm. the real business, yeah. kind of just messing around. Bit of a side hustle. Yeah. yeah. I think back then we were using MailChimp for emails where we yeah. were just like, far, like, and like, I think there was, that was before they broke the Shopify MailChimp integration because yeah. they had a fallout at some point. And I think when they then broke that, that then led us to kind of go, okay, we should maybe take some more seriously and, and we'll start working with kind of Clavio, who we, who we still use for all of our, e e or still use for email today. And I think they were like, but yeah, I mean, I think we really, really like, we learned a lot very quickly in, in probably over 2019. And then also just kind of figured things out. I mean, back then it was also like a matter of like, we had all these email addresses of people who'd used the customer Wi-Fi over the last decade. And we were like, just being like, hey, look who, 
Like, who wants it? And yeah, I mean, it was great. Like, there was like, like I didn't know what CAC was. I think it was, a, if anything, it was a real, like, it was a, a joyful period of my life where I was like, yeah, cool. Like, we acquired 10 customers today. <laughs> winner, winner. Like, and it, yeah, but you, you get these, like, I look back on these months and it's like, yeah, zero pounds spent on advertising, acquired 400 customers this month. And at the time, like, I thought it was, I thought we were doing quite well. But I also think this was the time of social media where you could whack on a few hashtags and you'd get bloody thousands of likes and impressions and followers. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I think Absolutely. we had a point then we were probably, we probably had about like 150,000 Instagram followers there. And it was kind of like, to some extent, we were basically, I mean, like at the beginnings of that pod, like, I mean, like, I say that, like, it, I mean, it sound, makes me sound clever when I say that, oh, we developed the brand into an e-commerce offering. But in reality, right, like we started selling merch from an Instagram page yeah. and the merch just happened to be like coffee pods. Yeah. And that was what like that. And it was great that first kind of year. And it was probably not, it was actually not until probably January 2020 where we really spent any money on like Facebook ads. And was that journey of kind of going from that very organic style of e com to actually now we want to start investing in this, really trying to bring in way more traffic, acquiring new customers. How did you find that in the early days? Yeah, I mean, like, I think it was, it was always really interesting in terms of like, I think that we, look, we, we learned very quickly through 2019. And then by 2020, we just had this kind of trial by fire through COVID where the point where we'd kind of, we had a few things lined up. We were going to start, we had a new machine coming into the roastery that was going to help us with some bits. And we had... Um, yeah, we had this kind of, this. we had this, like, we knew that we were going to start running Facebook ads. So we kind of set up an agency to do that for us. And we were, I mean, at the time we were spending like, we were like, okay, we're going to commit to spend 500 pounds a month through January through March, 2020, just like warming the account up mm -hmm. and like seeing what happened. Um, and so I think like we got, as a business then, we, we went through, I think probably the same journey that a lot of businesses do when, they start spending on Facebook for the very first time, particularly e-commerce businesses. But then just kind of COVID happened in March and it just kind of exploded. And I think also for us, it was also a point where we always knew that we wanted to, we always wanted to scale this bigger than we when they, than our 500 pounds a month Facebook account. And it was just, it was, that was the opportunity then in March. It then became a way for us to scale quite quickly on it. But yeah, I think like the point where we really, I mean, even through 2020, we were running out of stock. We were like, we had, we were, we had points where we were bringing point staff off furlough who were previously like chefs were coming off furlough to come and work at the roastery to do things like, like my, um, the person who was running our email for the first year was someone who, I mean, look, so obviously COVID happened for the business. And I mean, sorry, a bit of a bit of an aside here, but look, I mean, like it was a point where it was like, we had a, uh, brick and mortar business around London. Boris came on TV on like the Monday. I think I'd seen my mum that weekend and the weekend it was like, it was already kind of, it was all already falling off a little bit. And then by the Monday, it was like, we were 40% down week on week in terms of the cafes and the cafes. And you're like, at that point you have to start sending staff home be like, hey, look, we just, we just don't need you today. And then, and it was like Boris on TV doing his like, you should not be meeting friends thing on like the Tuesday. And like by the Thursday, we were like, I mean, it was effectively all over, right? We were, we were down 80 or 90%. People were leaving London. There was no support had been offered. And it wasn't really until the, and that, that was the worst week of my life. I mean, a point where you're like, you're there and you're like, you're literally sat in, a, sat in a room with a few people you've got remaining, like in terms of leadership of the business and talking about like, how, what, what are you going to do here for this? And then when furlough got announced, obviously that was a huge sigh of relief for us. And, we, and then, then kind of managed, managed that through the staff. But I had this kind of marketing team and I'm like, I've got someone who I'd hired six months previously to do like restaurant PR. And I'm like, right, ever use Clavia? And she was like, no. And so we just put, and so we want to use Clavia. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, and we had a, I mean, and to some extent it was a great, I mean, she's still with us in the, in the business today in a, in a different role. And it was great to have like, have these people where you're just like, like, let's just have a go. Right? Let's, let's have a go at Clavia. Like, I don't know, like, do you know what the difference between a campaign and a flow is? No. Right. Let's, let's <laughs> time to Google it. Right. And, we'll, and we, so we went through that whole journey in 20, in 2020. And that was amazing. I mean, I think we did, 
I think we did 10 grand of revenue in January 2020, 2020. And I think we did half a million in March. Like it was like, it was just like, it was like, it wasn't even a curve. It was just like, it just went yeah. up. But, one day. but yeah, like, it must have been a relief to have that website there already. Because I think so many yeah. businesses that were high street yeah. retail were like, well, we haven't even got a website. We've not yeah. even got an e-commerce site. Yeah. What are we going to do? And then they're having to build that. So to have that in place already, it was more about, yeah. well, let's just drive traffic to it. I think that thing of just like, I mean, I think the, the amount, I'm sure that the number of new Shopify accounts created in like March 20th, 2020 was just absolutely wild, right? Yeah. And it, I mean, it's one of those things, it makes us sound great now that we had this, we kind of had done all this work in advance. We already had the stock there. Mm -hmm. We already had suppliers set up. We already had all the people that we needed to make this. And we had things like our, had some version of these things set up and we had the kind of offering of, I mean, obviously we've rebuilt the websites probably mm -hmm. from the ground up probably twice since then, but like it's, but yeah, I mean, the fact that we weren't there suddenly, like in late March going, yeah, we better, how can we sell? I mean, to, to be fair, some businesses did really well out of it. I'm thinking like the, like the kind of meal kits that came out a lot, a lot of like, yeah, people like Deshume and um, Pizza mm. Pilgrims did a really good job of that. But yeah, I mean, like having to like break your back to build that in, a, in like a 10 day period must have been wild. I remember we were literally at, at, at this moment, this was a massive pivot growth for our business during this time. Yeah. Literally overnight, inbound inquiries had like tripled. We couldn't keep up. We were having to like hire weekly just yeah. to try and keep up with the amount of people that we needed to be able to fulfill a mass market that was exploding of people that wanted to start selling online. And also people who often had just, like people who just never done it before. Yeah. As in yeah. like people who were like, they never even operated a digital kind of business before. I mean like people who were like, they had a, a restaurant, right? And then they were like, right, how do we get this? How do we do this? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. But also on the consumer side, people that have never ordered online before yeah. were having to do it. My parents yeah. had never, ever ordered groceries <laughs> online in their lives. Yeah. And then suddenly they're having to do it. Yeah. There, there's, I mean, there was, there's that crazy point of just being a bit more like, if you could have like, if there were one thing that could have accelerated, I mean, like, I think you'd have probably, we'd have probably sat here in Mar in February, 2020 and gone, you know what? Like, people can't get any more online than they are already. <laughs> and then, yeah, and it was just like, it was like, it was your kind of pet, it was your real like, last holdouts of yeah. like people. And yeah, I mean, they, and also I think that thing, people had, a, I mean, even with things like furlough, people had a little bit more, a lot of people had a, lot, a little bit more money in their pocket. Yeah. And were kind of like, well, I can't go on holiday. I can't do anything else. Yeah. Like, I can't like, I don't really have any need for clothes. And so you're like, oh, let's like, and spending a lot more time at home. I mean, I think there were, there are so many reasons why for us it was, it was, I and mean, it sounds really, it sounds really mercenary to be like, it was great for us because it wasn't, it was a really tough period, but like the way that it did spike our sales in that way mm. um, was really, was not necessarily surprising if you look at it, back at it. I think Grind is a really interesting example of a business that was primarily bricks and mortar pre-pandemic to one that's literally sat down and gone, this is an evolve or die kind of moment. I actually remember seeing David on the news, like talking about needing more support for hospitality workers and how I imagine I, I, I had a lot of sympathy for people in hospitality at that moment because it was like, we don't have a job anymore because there's nobody that can come to the place that we need them to come to, to be able to actually make any money at all. Yeah. So I imagine that was absolutely terrifying. And I imagine, I imagine looking back now, you guys like, it was great, you know, we, we, blasted our e-com strategy but also i imagine that came with a great deal of pressure because it was like this has to work for us because that we are not making revenue elsewhere right now yeah i mean like it was kind of like i mean i think that was that 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 point was even just kind of i mean that look i mean it's, it's actually really i actually find it really hard to remember what it was kind of like because mm. i live i live on my own so i was probably on my own for like a solid three months of that first, like first beginning of lockdown there and that was like i mean it feels a bit like a bit of a fever dream i think that i was probably it was definitely, I mean, your level of personal uncertainty was so high that you were like, I mean, there was a, there were that, there was that point where it was definitely getting worse those first couple of weeks, like even as furlough came out and you were there looking at being like, oh, like, like at what level am I like, do I need to start like stockpiling like clean water and ammunition? <laughs> and you're it's like, like a zombie apocalypse yeah, type yeah, yeah, scenario. Just like, yeah, like, like <laughs> at some point, like you're going to be there, like, like. But you can't stockpile toilet roll because that was gone. Yeah, yeah. So I think like, I think the kind of, I mean, like, to some extent, I really enjoyed the kind of single-mindedness at that point. But yeah, like, you're there, you, like looking back, it was, yeah, it was, it was a quite, it was really just insane. I mean, David's got an insane story where, like, as we closed, we basically the day that we closed all of like all ten 
of his uh, all, all yeah, basically the day that we closed all like all ten of the sites and basically effectively sent the staff home semi permanently was a point where um we, and I think he he found out his wife was pregnant that day and he was like oh my god not only have I got this kid coming in six months but also my business that I've worked on for ten years has just effectively evaporated in the same twenty four hour period oh, but yeah I mean I mean yeah I mean it's like the the realities of like closing down that brick and mortar business was pretty wild because we're there and we're like, we've got a weekend's worth of stock in it. We've got a weekend's worth of stock. And it's like, there's someone there being, there's someone there because the staff being like, right, like kick open the kitchen doors. And they're like, right, like here's, if you, if there's, we've got toilet paper. Like if you want, does anyone, does anyone want to go home with like 15 steaks? Here you go. Like, <laughs> um, but I think that we, I think we, we approached that in like a really, I mean, looking back, like I think there were some businesses that made some really poor decisions in the early days of that. I think we were like, we approached it in a kind of quite a human way from the beginning. And we want, we've really gone off, off topic on here now we're talking about. <laughs> I'm, loving <laughs> this story. Yeah, I'm loving the story. Yeah. Well, obviously you saw a massive boom in e-com throughout the pandemic. Have you seen that sustain or have you seen a bit of a drop off? Yeah, like I think we've seen, look, we've seen sustained growth since then. It's been, it's just changed, right? I think like there's just, it's just so different now to what it was. And I think that to some extent we, like, I know that, I was kind of, I've benefited from people around me who've, who've been in e-commerce longer than I have in the fact that like, there was a huge amount that I felt that I learned over that first year with COVID that was just like, it was just like the product of just that year, right? It was like, there, there, was, there was even things, even things like e-commerce kind of tests that we do on the website. There was a point where maybe towards the end of 2021, where like, you kind of looked back at your like, everything your bible of learnings over the last 18 months and you're like this is just relevant now right and obviously things like there's so much kind of like stuff other things going on in the space that, i mean various other stuff i'm sure we'll come on to like any kind of ga4 ios 14 kind of drama and mm -hmm. like but like the point where you just throw you did everything that we felt worked for us in 2020 effectively no longer worked for us a year later and i think that a lot of that was also the benefit of like things like we had we acquired a huge number of customers very quickly there. And we were like, and it was probably easier to acquire them then. It was, they were also in just like a different headspace, needed things differently. They probably had more money in their pocket. So it wasn't necessarily that we've, that we, we've managed to sustain the growth, but we're doing it in very different ways now. And when you mention, you know, you, the things that you were doing before now weren't working for you, how do you navigate that? So like actually, how do you navigate that specifically? So you mentioned that you do like a lot of testing, for yeah. example, and seeing what's work. Can you kind of give us a few examples of like maybe split A-B testing or yeah. trying new things and, and how you actually monitor that? So I think that the way that we, I mean, like I was always, like the parts of e-commerce that I really like is the kind of, is the aspects of it that are almost like a science, right? That like you can run with the, with the right tools there that, and to be honest, some of the right tools have been mysteriously withdrawn from go by Google, but like, um, and it's always kind of finding new ways to kind of make those same things work. Um, but yeah, like I think the, I always was always, I always quite enjoyed the AB testing part of it. Something that we worked on a lot was always this kind of, I would call it like a subscription wizard. I don't, mm. this is, I always think of it as a wizard because it's like, you know, when you used to like install a program, yeah. it's like, like a, and you're like, I'd like you to install it in C step program by step. files. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so like, and not for most people, it's kind of either a page or like a modal thing that will pop up and you'll then, and that was obviously something for us that is like, was such a, I mean, all, I'd say 50% of all the testing we did over the website in the first year kind of went into that because in a lot of ways, the website early on, especially through COVID, it was like, it was just landing pages or a homepage that just led you to the wizard, right? It would be like, and all roads led to the wizard. And then the wizard would then have, but the wizard is really, those building those things is really hard because like, to some extent, we all know what a product page kind of looks like. Yeah, you've got your like add to cart and like there's a kind of a, a visual language to like regular e-commerce that to some extent looks like Amazon, right? It's like it's add to cart. Maybe there's a subscribe and save kind of radio button, but like, but the wizard is kind of like you can do whatever you want. Mm. So you then have these, to some extent, you've kind of got to build something that you feel works for your product. Mm. And that was something that we built and rebuilt over and over again where we would be doing tests on it. And I think thing, even just things like like offering, even I mean, even things as simple as being like, are you offering the kind of one-time purchase for subscription option as a kind of a two, col two columns or two rows mm -hmm. would be things that we would find ha would have kind of double digit 
um, impacts. And I think that the coming out of COVID was this point where it felt like everything we'd learn, like everyone's 18 month, probably, I don't know, let's say January, tw uh, March, 2020 to December, 2021, just had like COVID brain and COVID brain basically made everyone behave radically different on e-commerce and uh, than they would have mm, at any point sure. now. But yeah, so uh, but we, I mean, we tested that wizard to death and, and, we've, and, we, and we, we still do. It's, we're probably not as focused on subscription as we used to be, mm -hmm. but like, yeah, that, I mean, the challenges of the, I mean, the wizard is a crazy one for just like the kind of the long-term effects on it in terms of the, like, I mean, things like we will find, you have to kind of almost measure the, measure the, I mean, you have to measure the retention of people on that wizard, which is always a nightmare because you're like, you've kind of got to wait six months to see if they would like see how much of a disaster that cohort has been. Yeah. We still do loads of testing on the wizard today. It's probably the part of the business where we've put the most resource in terms of A-B testing there. And also one we just find there's just a endless series of kind of high single digit percentage improvements that you can make just by making like often dullest fucking iterations mm. just like just the most like boring like icons and things changing mm. um i always thought that was absolutely wild like our, we've we've tested like add to cart button colors for some of our merchants the color change difference even when tested over like 60 to 90 days it makes such a big difference yeah like i think before i did this job if if, if i'd started a brand and i had an agency telling me just make your add to cart buttons blue or something like that i'll be like Christ, I need to find another agency, but it makes such a big difference to yeah. merchants, it, it, the, the output. So when you talk about the wizard, um, you're talking about that lovely flow that you get on site that kind of like asks you how much you how much coffee you drink and and uh, and then outputs what the right subscription would be, right? Because yeah. I guess it's hard for customers. They go, oh, I think I have three coffees a day. But does that include weekends? I and mean, yeah. you're, you're trying to work out how many pods and coffees you're going to get through um, in a certain period of time, right? Is that something that you've kind of experimented with in terms of suggesting different sized subscriptions? And yeah. So, like, it's a really funny one with the wizard in that, like, in that, because obviously we do all this testing and we get, and a lot of it comes, comes down to, you're mostly looking at things like conversion rate and then, mm as long as you can, you can kind of get towards like, okay, what's these, what do these certain set of circumstances lead to as an mm -hmm. LTV um, for, particularly for subscribers. And I mean, limits, limiting this just in terms of subscribers, the thing that we find with it and that like, it's kind of that like classic, like data survey thing, where that like, if you think, if you want to ask, like, what do your customers think about coffee or slippers or mattresses? And in reality, they don't think about it, right? Like, I mean, I <laughs> sim they don't know how many coffee coffees they drink. They know that they probably, okay, like probably, probably they probably have an, a reasonable idea of kind of within a kind of, I don't drink coffee, I do drink coffee, or I drink a lot of coffee, but like, they don't really have an in-depth idea and no one's gonna sit there being like, okay, well, I drink three coffees a day, but I don't drink it on weekends and bank holidays. So I'm like, <laughs> and it's just like, no one's doing that math. So we find a huge amount and we always have done is that basically people will take what we recommend them on the wizard, mm -hmm. which to some extent from an e-commerce, from an e-commerce testing perspective is even worse because in an ideal world, your wizard is effectively a questionnaire where you can go, look, tell us what you want. One, two, three. And we go cool. Like here. And it kind of, it just spits out this perfect package based on the accurate information that you've given us. In reality, no one does that. People click, the vast, vast majority of the time, people will, will take the option that you put a most popular on mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, the price that you true. put a most popular on. And it's crazy because like yeah. it has a massive impact on like, it, it, but it basically means that a lot of the time you can, you have to measure the impact of e-commerce testing on LTV. And you're there like, we don't have the time. I, I don't like, and I, I don't know what tests we were running three months ago to mm. like have to look back and follow up and go, I mean, the worst one we've got, the, the, and this is the worst test that we did on this one, and it's the one that was always the piss me off the most, mm -hmm. is that we have this thing where like, we, as we added more and more blends over time, we have a thing where we try and recommend people the blends that we think that they're gonna like. And the range of them is quite, like, from, the, from the light blend to the extra dark blend that we've like, we've most recently added, like, like there's a, so there are meaningfully different products. Like one of them is very, very, one of them is very strong. It's almost bitter. The other one is almost kind of fruity and like acidic even. And then, and that like we try and get, but basically people will take the kind of most popular combination mm. of them. 
And then we then, for a while, we touched up, and for a while, we were, people, we were giving people like one blend. So we go, we go, they take the most popular blend, which send them three boxes in a kind of letterbox box of that one. And after a while, we started giving them, um, let's, let's give them a range, right? Let's give them a range and set up a flow in Clavia that would be like, hey, look, we sent you these three. Which one was your favorite? Log in and go and test. And of course, that's like, like we know, like I'm sure most people do, a level of interaction with the, with kind of the admin of going in and changing your, changing your product generally correlates to a higher level of engagement and to a higher, mm -hmm. like people will stick around longer. The people who go and fuck around with a subscription generally last the longest. Mm -hmm. um, although I'm, it's unsure what the kind of correlation or causation there. But anyway, so we, th we thought we'd incentivize the behavior of, of having a few different flavors. So at least we hopefully we're kind of giving you something you like there and then encouraging you to go in and go and change it. No one changes it. Everyone gets, everyone gets this. <laughs> like we've got like thousands of people who just receive the starter pack and they get, they get, they get a star pack of like, I don't know, maybe the light blend, dark blend, house blend, it'd be a kind of middle of the range one. And mm. yeah, they just never change it. It's like six yeah. months on and they're still getting their same three blends that we started. Yeah, because like, people are lazy inherently. Uh, they just want yeah. their coffee to turn up and then that's it. They can forget about yeah, it. And I'm just like, you know. like, there must be one, you must have a favorite. These are like, these are three really, like, they're like, I mean, I have the pods at home. Like, I know that I, there are some other pods that I like more than others. Like I will be there in my kitchen, like fishing for the, fishing yeah. for yeah. a good pod. Well, not a good pod, fishing yeah. for my favorite pod yeah. that like out in there. And I'm like, surely you just, do you just like take, take like we've got an app just like take 30 seconds, just go, yeah. just go and change it. And people just don't, it must they be just a, don't. Yeah, it must be a challenge though, like the different levels of coffee drinkers though, because you've yeah. got the people with like the freeze dried coffee in their, <laughs> their cupboard and that's yeah. all they ever drink. Probably people in the middle like me who like nice coffee, but I'm not really into my coffee. Yeah. I don't know the different types of yeah. beans. I just like strong, nice coffee. But then there's the people who are like super into their coffee. They know exactly what type of beans they want, you yeah. know, so you kind of have to cater for those middle, those top two, really. I think the Nespresso thing is quite an interesting one for us because it kind of, because we basically win every, I mean, we, we win nine out of 10 customers kind of often. I mean, to some extent, there's Nespresso's marketing funnel and then we're the second half of Nespresso marketing funnel. They're great at giving you an incredibly cheap machine that mm. we will then, and they'll sell you the machine and we're happy to, to take you, take you from Nespresso once you realize the pods are bad for the planet. But like, and that's a quite a good one for us in terms of price because we are roughly the same price as Nespresso, although depending on if you're subscribing or not on the volumes you're buying and you can probably pay a bit more or a bit less. But the like, in terms of like what a cup of coffee at home costs, like if you're drinking Nescafe, it's like, it's like 6p a cup. It's like, I mean, it's just <laughs> incredibly cheap. Whereas you can buy, I mean, if you're buying like premium bean or ground coffee, you can pay 70p a cup. And so, but actually like, so, the price range within that, in terms of what you expect to spend, is just wild. But it also tastes like absolute shit as well. <laughs> yeah. no, I just can't do it. No, I can't. Yeah, I just cannot do it. I haven't I even got any in my house, there. freeze dried. Yeah, we I just can't. We You're find... just above that, Andrea. Aren't you? I'm just yeah. People do, like, <laughs> Too we much find for a lot that. People don't know like that Nestle is Nespresso. I yeah, I I, mm. I actually did know this. But I really think that they purposely done that because everybody hates Nestle. But I'm like, you yeah. think that they give a diff more, a, 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 I've said more different name, right? I mean, like it's like yeah. Nestle Espresso. Like it wasn't even a very imaginative meeting at all. Like, but like people just don't know. I mean, we have people who are like, oh, I really hate Nestle. Like, and of course Nestle is like, I mean, like there's a, I mean, a, there's a probably a Wikipedia page right now that's like list of borderline war crimes committed by Nestle over the years. Mm -hmm. Like there's probably like a yeah. Um, there's, there's so much of that. And then like, but people don't, they, they just don't seem to know. They've got George Clooney's good looks. Yeah. Yeah. I also think it's like <laughs> Nestle and the branding of Nespresso are very different. Like yeah. it's so like high end luxury. Mm. Even the in-store experience is very like, you've got these baristas like mm. pouring the posh pods into the posh cups. You know, it feels like, oh, this can't be Nestle. This can't be the people that do mm. your cereals as well as your yeah. coffee pods, which I think's mad. But what I absolutely love about you guys, and I don't know if this is because I live in London, but is your out of home marketing campaigns that you do. And to be honest, I haven't seen this massively. Of course, the high end fashion brands, the big well known fashion brands we see on billboards all the time. But I don't think out of home is like in the first top two checklist of starting your e com business, yeah. which I absolutely love. I'm on Instagram seeing your compostable pods and I'm sitting on a tube and seeing the exact same branding appearing to me there. Yeah. Is that something you've done like from the off? Is that, has that been like a new trial or like, no, what was the thinking behind out of home marketing in London? Yeah. I mean, like, I think that like, 
you could probably make an argument for us that, that, Lon that La London out of home is probably the wrong. I mean, if there were anywhere, I mean, we've got a, probably about we've got about a thirty percent level of kind of prompted brand recognition in London. Probably about nineteen percent in the rest of the country. In theory, that's where we ought to do it. I think that one of the things we found was that one of the things we liked about the out of home is it felt like it was something that coherently tied the the real tangible business that people know to the fact that we sell coffee pods on the internet, right? Mm. And it's that thing that, I mean, we, we reckon that like, I mean, some of the surveys that we pull, we think that of the people who are aware of Grind in London, only about 55% of them know that we do coffee pods or that we have a website. Like people just, and it's, it's one of those things, even, even things like, like how do you hear about us data that we will pull from, um, that would be like a classic like bread and butter e-com metric just have there in a kind of in your post checkout survey like 30 or 40 percent of people will be like oh i heard of brian already because of the cafes and you're like did you so we've got this we have got this weird kind of hangover where we where like people do people know about us from a business that we were had five or ten years ago like we've kind of got two businesses in one in that sense i think that out of home is something that's really exciting for us because it was just like I mean, like, maybe I'm just a sucker for the fact that like, that like you can go and buy something you can go and see in real life. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's probably a, I think this e-commerce is to some extent become, well, up until fairly recently, it feels a lot like a science a lot of the time, right? And I know that we all, as mostly kind of data -y people, have an, are probably prefer a more measurable channel to one that is less measurable. And that there's no doubt about it, right? Like I'm thinking, okay, the people will global will try and tell you this is a measurable channel. Like there are abstractions you can do and you can try and you can try your best, but like, it's not really, it's, it's a much less measurable channel than mm -hmm. the other ones you're working on. We just felt like it was like, it was felt like it was something that we wanted to do and that we would be able to tie together the kind of online and retail, the online businesses and our physical brick and mortar stores in a way that was very, inherently London and to be honest like especially over maybe the last year or so it's it's quite cost I mean it's not even on like an impressions basis it's insanely cost effective I mean just like it's like it's basically the only place in TFL the tube car panels are like you can pick those tube car panels up for like seven pounds a panel right they're like they are on the basis of what that would call what that that's probably gets you 600 eyeballs on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, like the level to which it is there in the world on an impressions basis, is just insane. And I think that London's, I mean, TFL and the Tube to Tube network is probably the most efficient out of home media network in the world. As in like, look, you, I mean, you like, you have, a, you have a hard time justifying spending on billboards in Manchester, but like there, like you're getting a pretty good rate on it. Mm -hmm. And did I see on LinkedIn that you guys are going to be going on telly? Yeah, soon? so we, we actually ran a TV test back in June. Um, that was yeah. We, I mean, producing a TV ad was absolutely wild. Which I mean, that was <laughs> yeah. like a, that was a bit of a. I love this. Yeah. You went from literally washing cups in Grind Cafe to like producing <laughs> yeah. telly ads. It like, was this great. is an amazing story. Um, There's like a really good story about the guy who like the guy. I think he might be there still be like a CEO of that like, London Zoo. Like was like a guy who like was like a at one point, a shit shoveler in London Zoo. <laughs> yeah. like, um, that's the dream, maybe. No, it's not. It's not um, and then, but yeah, um, well, look, the TV ad has been, I mean, the TV even more so requires a kind of a, I mean, look, measuring that on a kind of CAC basis is anything less than like two years is absolutely wild, right? And it certainly takes a level of ambition and some potentially quite deep pockets so as to be able to do so as to be able to do that but look i think that's kind of i think that look certainly there are you can count the number of dc brands particularly in the uk who've managed to make tv ads working on kind of one hand in fact if you list off the ones that you've the list of the dc brands that you've seen over the last maybe like i don't know five ten years on like you're probably counting up like three mattress brands and then maybe like made.com which went moonpig don't forget Moonpig. Yeah, Moonpig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Moon, Moon the economics of Moonpig. Uh, got a really, I'd love to dig into that business. I mean, who, who knows how that all works? Oh, well, Must maybe we paying. get them on the podcast yeah. soon. Yeah. Watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then, but so like, I think there's like the kind of the Shopify brands on TV is probably a pretty short list in terms of those yeah. who've been able to make it work. And like, it's no doubt a challenge. I think that for us, it was a matter of the fact that like, it matched the ambitions that we have for the business in terms of where we'd like to see it go. Also, we're as we're moving kind of more into supermarkets, so we're now we'll be in Waitrose for a few months and we're going to be adding a few more later in the year. Like it felt that we needed to, to 
step away a little bit from this kind of D to C funnel playbook and look more and start talking about things kind of like share of voice and of the and of metrics that perhaps people in the past invented for selling people Colgate in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really wise right now to be diverse. We're seeing a lot of brands in D to C that are seeing a recession of sales and revenue mm -hmm. right now because things are tough. People, we know that consumer spending is reducing. The economy is difficult right now. And I think that's really amazing that you guys are still seeing sustained growth beyond that boom, which is really exciting. And do you think that's probably because of your diverse outlook on your marketing strategies and not putting all the eggs in the Facebook or meta basket? Yeah, I think like, I mean, look, I think it's certainly a part. Of it. I think that we've got a, we probably to some extent, even like if I was really critical of myself, I'm sure we left some, we probably left money on the table in 2020, mm. right? Like I think that we were an incredibly scrappy team then. And I look at numbers like our kind of retention figures and things like even just the, 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 the kind of the level to which we segment email in the way now that we did 18 months ago. And I go, we are, the business is materially better selling people's stuff than we were a year than we were a year or two ago so like we had we had, had made a new e-commerce hire about probably about a year year and a half ago now who was just like i mean he came in and he just like he just changed the game and i think that there's it's really nice where to be still at a point in the business where you can make these like big swings and like like make these like big wins and to have these people like and, and to have people who are kind of best in class there and to come in and just like just like, just blow you away with the kind of work that they can do. Teddy, we've missed one thing, and that's the big out of home elephant oh, yeah. in the room. <laughs> I can't let us move on without talking about it. So, I've seen that you booked you you uh, booked a very big billboard in Leicester Square over a certain GB News. Yeah, um, I need to hear this story. I wasn't going to let you come on our podcast without hearing all the gossip. <laughs> so I'm we, sorry. Um, yeah, so so like, I mean, like. To, TV 101, when you want, and I have to do this bit, that's my disclaimer. So when you run a TV <laughs> ad, like the way that they, they, a lot of the agencies will do is you'll do a level of testing, which is great for them because like they get to sell you another, I don't know, another set, six digit number of TV advertising. But then you effectively just like spread it very, very thin. And it's, I think it's probably to what in TV terms, what they will consider to be as close to like testing as they'll get and as doing anything. But then like, and so, so you then look at that and you can then look at kind of, which of these spots are driving impressions. But this effectively means putting TV ads everywhere. And one of those TV ads, one of the places you can buy TV ads in, for not for surprisingly little in 2023, <laughs> as I discovered, is GB News. So, so we, we had an ad that runs on GB News. And I mean, like, like, if you, I would really recommend, for not because of the programming, to just go and watch the standard of production value that exists on GB News in 2023. Like, it's like, it's like someone's YouTube channel. Like, it's like, like, there's like, like, there's just like, the, the child podcast has a, has a, a much higher level of production value, unsurprisingly. We even got a pink than, light for this one. Yeah, yeah look at that. that. GB News. No, they haven't. They need one. But like, and they have, the, only, <laughs> the ads they have are these things where it's like, there's like, it, it'll be like, it's like a, we will buy your gold. It's like, there's that one, we will buy your gold ad that's rolled over and over. Like, and then, and look, I think that, like, look, I think that we, we if I'd read an, someone document of a huge level of listings more carefully we probably wouldn't we wouldn't have our gb news in the first place it's probably it's likely not where our customer is it probably has some and and, and unsurprisingly it has some values that kind of don't align with us particularly around sustainability climate change with that said like i think as a whole we're mostly a lot of the time we're a pretty apolitical brand right like we're not gonna like we're not we're not in the business of like endorsing candidates for things um so that to be honest like the whole thing was broadly something we'd have largely liked to have stayed out of but yeah so we we basically we ran someone messaged us on twitter and was like hey like a, like your ads on gb news and we were like oh that's weird so we kind of just immediately like not really thinking that much about that being like, oh sorry must have like missed that one other thing we we're like messaged them with hey look we should stop running this out to the rent message the agency and then like gb news who've obviously got some sort of like i mean look, i would I imagine they need to drive some in they, they're probably not do they don't seem to be they seem to be struggling on ad revenue because I think there are a lot of people at like Ikea and Santander and a lot of these, and Vodafone have, have been through this whole process previously. But for some reason, this was just something that they decided that like a few of their presenters started messaging us, then sending us tweets. And then of course, like um, Lawrence Fox, who's kind of won there, at least like more public figures, mm -hmm. certainly kind of an entertainment personality um, came 
and basically kind of decided that he would like, and basically had this whole thing about how he was going to, he was, be buy, would, would never buy car and coffee again. Cause I think he's been into one of them once or twice. Um, and he then kind of decided he was going to rally these people. And so we got, I mean, I think we got probably, we got 65,000 tweets in the space of about 24 hours. And we were like oh number five <laughs> trending on Twitter. Cause like, I mean, I did, but like with this said, I mean, like there was a point where like the, the smaller GB news presenters really like, they like rallied some of their kind of viewers. And we got some, we had some kind of pretty offensive emails of some people. Um, so, but, but yeah, once Lawrence Fox kind of weighed in, it felt that like the momentum of it just completely turned into our favor. And I think there's probably an element where that like the people who are, he's kind of a bit of a Katie Hopkins character in that mm -hmm. like, I think that a lot of the people following on Twitter kind of just do it to disagree. Like he's kind of, He's a just, he just he just professionally says incendiary things. So if you, I mean, if you go and find the comments on it now, like the comments in this post are just people being like, "Ha, just ordered grind, just ordered some grind coffee," and we saw like a, probably like a three x spike in revenue that day. Like, <laughs> and, like seems to be good publicity. And people like I mean like how do you hear about us? People like there's like there's like sixty percent of orders in this day. It's like how do you hear about us? Being like Lawrence Fox Twitter. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. And that, and, and that like clearly it was just something that like. He, yeah, and so, so but then we, we let that roll on. And it's really weird. If you go onto our twist now, there are still people arguing about it. Look, I think in reality, like we were not a, this was never really about us, right? This was a kind of a, this was like the GB News kind of war on woke stuff. Mm -hmm. And we just happened to be the battleground by which it took place. And I'm sure that today they're, they've got some new like person. But no, it was, but like, I mean, look, look I think thanks to Lawrence, right? Like thanks for introducing us to all these lovely new customers. Yeah. Hopefully, like, <laughs> and you guys, you booked a, Billboard, yeah. In so we, Square, have, right? yeah. So we thought, so we like, we thought it would just be pretty funny to like. I mean, that you can pick these things up for like nothing. These, mm. these billboards, right? I mean, don't tell like, on that. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, so, but like, but no, so we, so we made like, a, we made a, um, we made a big donation to like WWF in his name, and we and we built, bought, put a billboard and set, put up a load of the tweets that were quite mm. fun things. It just felt like the whole thing was just so silly, and just in terms of that whole kind of like. They this like how the fact that we thought we were we were censoring them by not advertising on it, but also we'd never previously advertised on it, and they're almost I mean like one hundred percent. I mean rounded up to one hundred percent of all other businesses in the UK don't advertise on it. Yeah, and it, this idea that we had some sort of like obligation to be there was very mm. just very strange. Yeah, I think it's wild. I think cancel culture is generally quite wild, but that's one I yeah. won't debate right now. Yeah. Otherwise, we might be on a, we might end up putting <laughs> tweets on a billboard in the middle of London. <laughs> so one area I really want us to dive into because I think I've had this experience with you guys is how you treat B two B customers yeah. over your D two C strategy, which I think is really different on site. As you can see on our lovely coffee table here, we have got lots of your products dot dotted around the office. Now, one thing that struck me is when I went on your website, I was like, oh, right, I want to get some coffee pods for the office. So I don't have to keep thinking about getting more bloody coffee for the office. Um, and what struck me is that actually when I was, you know, when I was looking for um, B2B or, or office supplies, I think you call it, um, it was a very different experience, almost like a separate website feeling in the way that you were treating me compared to if I was a DTC customer. How are you guys doing that? And what was like the thought process of how you want to talk to B2B customers and yeah. offices, let's say, I mean, differently. I think when, as we came out of, as we kind of people merged back to the office, we realized that there was something that we kind of, we'd never really thought about it was for the first, like, because we were, we were basically, I think we were probably 99%, for some reason, was in the office in 2020. So we realized it was something we wanted to do. And actually, to be honest, it was, it was actually just our kind of, we had our kind of head of customer experience, who kind of runs all that kind of customer service team. And then, um, our e-commerce manager were basically like, they just kind of did it between themselves. And at the time, when we first started, it was really just like, it was a separate landing page that basically came into a kind of a, we just, I mean, I mean, something that I like, I think all the team do, but certainly something that I've always tried to do is just like, just do the simple, like just do like the simplest possible thing that could possibly work, right? And so for us there, we basically just took the wizard as it was at the time, just real copy pasta. I love that you called it. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. And then just like, it's gonna catch on, it's gonna be a thing. And then, uh, and then like, We're gonna any, start having any, on our any proposals. Any mode will flow, it's yeah. like a wizard. Yeah. Would you like a wizard on your website? <laughs> yes. yes. And then, um, 
<laughs> yeah, we, we, so we just like we just changed the text and made it. We effectively built a kind of like equivalent of like a type form that would then just like open a ticket within the customer service team. But then we realized after a while it wasn't even that much work to like build in a subscription thing where we could just give them a we could depending on the price of what they were getting, we give them a kind of variable rate of discount. I think that we're unique in this for B two B, where like um, we are. I mean, it's kind of, a, it's not, we're not kind of, a, we're not like a cleaning company, right? And they're like, no one expects to have an invoice from us in 30 day payment terms. It's like, there's an office manager with a credit card and they can just slap it on there and they can have pods delivered from us. Mm -hmm. But like, we're, we're quite a B2B business now. The way that businesses online are working with B2B businesses is really changing right yeah. now. Because, the, you know, it was only like two, three years ago, every time that we'd speak to new potential merchants that want to work with us, it would be, how do you manage your B2B customers? Oh, well, we send them this really big Excel spreadsheet and they tell us how many pack size or units yeah. they want of everything. They'll ping it back to David, he sits in the B2B desk and they'll write up an invoice and they'll process the order. Which seems wild, doesn't it? Why, they, yeah. why the hell do they, is there so much manual process in B2B? But, you know, Shopify this year launched their entire new B2B suite yeah. within Shopify Plus, which is awesome, The actually. B2B suite's really good in Shopify. And is this something you guys are leveraging in terms of, like, technology? Yeah, I think, like, I think that the technology around, around it is quite... Is, Challenging. I mean, I think this just beyond the we haven't really experimented it beyond Shopify and kind of building it on a mixture of our own subscription engine and Shopify's B two B. Like sometimes, like it's it's as simple as just being like, okay, approving email addresses to get a certain twenty five percent off or whatever, mm -hmm. and then they can just buy it on they, and then and they buy it in bulk. But I think a lot of it is also about the kind of the products you're able to offer and like, are you going to be like, and are you going to be sending them what's effectively just a kind of a, a vast multiple of what you're selling to regular customers. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been, it's been really interesting. We've, and we've had quite a lot of take up from it. I think particularly the sustainable brand, it's kind of like that there's, a, I think that the number one request that people will be making and are making in offices is so much around like, I mean, certain offices that even have people who literally would job is to go around and be like, is this toilet paper? Could we be swapping this out for a more sustainable kind of ESG option? Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, yeah. And also like talking to a lot of merchants sort of um, at the beginning of a growth journey, B2B has almost become like an aspirational thing for them now. Yeah. And it used to be like 10 years ago, it was like you're either a B2C or you B2B yeah. business and there's no crossover. But now, like when I talk to brands sometimes, oh, and eventually like two years, we want a real B2B offering. We want to have a whole wholesale operation. It's like yeah. become quite an aspirational thing but for it's, it's B2C brands. It's always kind of a bit down the line. Right? I'm like, I don't yeah. know why more people just don't like, you can get like a, a base, okay, you can, you can get your kind of, to some extent, your kind of basic CRM, some kind of version of giving people a discount for bulk orders. Like you can do that in 20 minutes in Shopify. Mm. Because even if you don't want to go for Shopify Plus, there's loads of apps like the Wholesale Club that literally lets you offer all those great things like volume-based discounts, retail prices, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. One thing, you know, we're just working on a B2B project right now, which is 50-50 D2C, um, D2C, B2B. Now, what I think we've found is actually in the design and UI processes of this project is you have to really get in the head of a, of a B2B buyer. Like it's things like when you go to a product page, it's how can we add lots of different sizes really quickly on one click? Because if we go down the D to C route, it would be right, click, me click medium, add 10, press add to cart, add another small. So yeah. actually finding ways that within a D to C look and feel, you know, it's on this site that we're just about to launch on the P uh, PDP, there's like sizes that all have quantities next to them and you can simply go up in tens uh, and add them all straight to Carl, having different uh, view states based on login. Um, but actually, I think it's really interesting on how uh, Shopify has taken on B2B with like a really unique My Account area, um, which I've literally been learning as we've been going through this project, to be perfectly honest with you, because we're not seeing many merchants really jumping on it just yet. Uh, and it's things like having a company entity, which then manages staff levels within that have buying power within within a company. Really? It's those extra levels of of yeah. how they can really automate B2B um, yeah. operations in the same way you would D2C, because at the end of the day, it's just people choosing product, going on a website, yeah. pressing yeah. checkout, uh, oh. and, and even doing things like, you know, your net 30-day terms, volume-based tiered discounting, mm -hmm. unique discounts per customer, which I think is really awesome. But I really think that it's so important from the experience of this product is just to really try and get in the head of a B2B buyer because it's things like 
how does wish list? How's that actually going to? If a brand wants to have a certain way of considering what they might buy in the future, how does wish list work on a scale? How can we add multiple products to a you know a, a saved list of product offering? Yeah. Um, so I think from a UI perspective, there is still this transition of yes, we've definitely got great tooling now that allows us to do it relative ease, but actually it's still really going to take the strategic minds of e-com experts and designers to really go, right, this is great for D2C because you can add to cart, you can subscribe, but this is terrible for B2B who need to do things on bulk. Yeah, and it's also like tone of voice and structure of the site as well. It's like, do you just give them the same experience but with different pricing? Or do you have like a, you know, you see it where they go off to a little microsite or a sort of trade yeah. portal, you know, for those types of customers? Because you probably want to have a slightly different tone of voice, you know, to those customers. Um, There's so many websites where it's like, if you wanted to go and add 30 of something, you would have to go on and just like press a little plus, like add one to your site yeah. and then go and just be like, Plus, 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 plus. Yeah, it's like, and then there's the pause between yeah. each class. It's like, yeah. I cannot do this anymore. Yeah. No, yeah. thank you. Give me the Excel spreadsheet. And it only goes up to, it probably goes only up to nine. It starts back at zero. Again yeah, like, yeah. No one's oh ever considered God. the possibility that no one's ever going to order that much of one. <laughs> so earlier you mentioned that like subscription has been a less of a focus for the brand. Now, I'll be honest, we're hearing retention, retention, retention on everything because acquisition is really difficult. But I also know that you guys have a really different acquisition strategy to most of the brands we talk to. Why is subscription sitting on the back burner for you guys or, or maybe less of the number one focus right now? Yeah, I mean, I think subscription is a bit of a funny one for us because it's kind of like, it's, I think there are, look, I think that look, as a kind of, as someone who was with, working with my team, I have to look, I'm always looking for this kind of like a, the kind of perfect KPI, right? It's like, what is this number? You're kind of, you're like, if you want to get real management consultant, you're going to start calling it like North Star KPIs or whatever. But being like, okay, like what is this kind of singular thing we want to optimize towards? And I found that with subscription over time, it just felt like it was particularly as the way the world has kind of changed in terms of that kind of, particularly around kind of things like cost of living and the Facebook and platform changes, subscription is just increasingly disaligned with all of those with all the other variables so so, so i think mean, like i think like a lot of things i mean things like i mean the grazes of the world probably for the first to do it but like the even things like kind of things like netflix or whichever we've all been subscription is generally about a heavily incentivized first order right like a really 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 low first order aov mm -hmm. which always means you're just going to pick up a load of, you're just going to pick up a, a disaster number of people, right? In terms of, you're going, to, you're going to pick up a number of people who are, you're going to have an incredibly low first order retention rate, right? Because you're just going to, you, you, anyone is going to pick up 30 coffee pods for a fiver. Yeah. Um, and something for us, I mean, like, I, like, so looking at this kind of, what are my kind of perfect, what are my perfect kind of metrics to look at? And I found that like first order, what I would say contribution margin or like gross mar first order gross margin, is just a massive lever for us in terms of just, in terms of like how much, how quickly can we pay off the CAC on a customer, right? So like how quickly can we can we pay off the customer acquisition cost of that, of that customer? And it in areas of the business where we would kind of drive in a subscription really hard, there would be like, we'd make 50p on our first order, right? In terms of that, in terms of gross margin. Whereas now we can like, and a lot of that was because subscription AOV is just terrible. It's just like, it's just naturally, it's just like people want to have a very low risk first order, first order, um, which means you get a lot of customers who are kind of, they're not particularly high intent customers. Like you're not making customers have a greater level of intent. You're just lowering the bar to people who kind of don't really care, but they're here for an offer. Right. And that you're often kind of getting people in, getting people into a subscription. I mean, even we see this on the website where we'd have people who come to the site and we like one in three of our subscriptions doesn't even come from the wizard, which comes from a subscribe and save on a product page. Mm -hmm. But like that person was going to spend more the money than that until we put them onto a subscription. Um, and you look at it and you just go like, like, like genuinely, I know genuinely, anyone who would listen to this, I would implore anyone to look at like the customer economics and the unit economics of subscription businesses. As in like, if you're selling someone something for 25 pounds, monthly you are literally pissing money away on fulfillment costs and packing up like as in like we if you're like we, we're, we're experimenting now with moving a lot of our subscribers onto less frequent 
deliveries. And the, in the kind of vein of Estrid do it, small, have on kind of quarterly, quarterly subscriptions. And they're like, monthly subscriptions are just wild. Like, I mean, like, like the amount, like, if I look at them, the businesses offering monthly subscriptions, like almost all of them are spending more money sending you that parcel than they are on the, on the contents of that parcel, right? Like things you're buying for like, people at 9.99 through your letterbox every month, like, like three quid of that is definitely going on getting it through your letterbox. And it's just like, it's cars on the road. The economics of it are really, really difficult. Like why, like, why should we send you 30, pod, 30 pods when we could send you 90 pods if we can convince you to do that? Because most people can shove yeah. them in their like everything cupboard, can't they? And yeah. yeah. And actually, I think I think it's a really good point. It's really annoying having so many deliveries all the time. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a subscriber of Heights, the the vitamins, and they've literally just started doing this. I always used to pay. Uh, you could you could make a saving by, by by paying for three months up front, but they would deliver it monthly. And I always used to think to myself, these pots are not that big. Like, just send me all three, and then send me another one in three months' time. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. So I think that's so. And how are you like educating your customers right now to, to move them over to like a quality delivery, for example? The way we're doing it is basically passing, I mean, passing hopefully pays, passing a lot of the saving onto the customers so that we're, look, we looked at it and we realized that it's, we can make, there are, there are sustainability arguments that less kind of cars on the road delivering this stuff. But in reality, like this was something that we look, I mean, I, I look back and like, I came up with this, I think I came up with the, the 30 pods in a letterbox thing for £13.50 a month when we were like when we had 200 customers and i'm like the fact that we haven't even really um changed beyond that it's just absolutely wild right looking and, it, and even then even things like the fact that that's kind of been our recommendation for people through the wizard and a huge amount of people take that recommendation it's just one of those things where like, it's definitely gonna be a big change but i'd like to think we could kind of take a significant double digit percentage of people over where do you think the future of e-com is going because it is changing it is changing and i i don't honestly know that anybody has come up with like the clear vision of what it looks like like a few years ago it was like everybody's buying online retail's dead goodbye but now we're in this transitional period again i'd love to get your view teddy on where you think e-com is yeah. now moving towards so i think like i think i don't know this is something i think about a lot and i think like i mean i'm kind of i look at kind of like kind of communities like kind of DTC quite big on Twitter. There's a lot of people there, a lot of like, a lot of hot takes on there. Um, and I think that like, there's a problem we've got at the moment in e-commerce, which is the idea that there's this, well, there's always a crisis, right? There's like, there's iOS 14 was a crisis for digital marketers, right? And there was this point where like, effectively everyone, everything that everyone knew before that, a lot of it kind of went in the bin. And I think the GA4, stuff is, is probably in the same i'd say that in the same camp and everyone's very worried about ga4 now and then the the move of all these platforms to being kind of a bit more like black boxes where like things like kind of these like performance max campaigns or whatever like, like no one really knows what's going on there it's just kind of like increasingly facebook is like facebook is optimizing itself towards a world where you just upload a jpeg and it just goes and it goes right we're going to take it from here and then it'll send you a bill at the end of the month mm -hmm. right and then um and i find that like we're, there's a problem when that, then we now have where we now act like we're in this kind of crisis, right? And I think people, I mean, listen to podcasts, people, like, people talk about it a lot, and they're really worried about it. But in reality, like this is an incredibly young industry, right? And that there just so happens to have been a very, very kind of chilled moment where a lot of people made a lot of money between maybe kind of, I don't know, 2013 to maybe 2018, 2019. And at that five year period was a period where there were lots of kind of great IPOs and people felt that this was a thing and they decided this was how D to C e-commerce, this is how this was going to be. And it's like, it like and that like, if, like, I mean, I, I think about it a lot in terms of like people who work in social media now, as in we've got to a point now where there are people who are in there, people who've always had careers in social media who are now in their kind of forties, right? And you go, if there was a job that you could, if that you were going to be sent to prison tomorrow, and you were going to be the most useless at in two years' time, 
it would be social media, right? Like, imagine if you were like, imagine if you went to prison in 2020, or like you were stranded on a desert island, like you would be the world's least employable social media manager. And I think there's a danger of this with like, within, within e-com, where that like, basically you've got people who are like, you've got like, what do you have that you learned selling, I don't know, hairbrushes or God forbid mattresses on the internet <laughs> in 2015 that is applicable to this now. And if you look, even if you look at the businesses that were successful, like, okay, let's, let's not name any names, but like, let's say a number of businesses that might sell you pairs of glasses or mattresses or trainers that went on to have very successful IPOs and you, well, at the time, very successful IPOs. If you look at those businesses, like, like they told us at the time, that this was about, this was about DTC. It was about the new way of engaging with people. It was about the fact that like, they're gonna, they are disrupting these old industries. They've got this incredibly better, they've got much better product. They've got much smarter people. There's all this kind of science. And it's like, it's like these businesses were just built on the back of the fact that like Facebook, like Facebook CPMs were like, 25% of what they were now. It's like, like, if you take any business who feels like they're struggling now, like apply your Facebook 2020, 2015, three pound CPM to it. And you'll mysteriously realize what the difference is. Between. Like, mm. like this stuff is just gonna get, it's just gonna get harder and harder and harder. And, and almost every success story is built on a very small list of factors that are just now no longer the case. Look, I think like, look, I think if you were, if you were going to try and develop the skills that would be useful in this industry in two years time, right? It would be ability to pick up new tools quickly. It would be some level of resilience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm like, well, maybe it may sound really old, but like, can you remember when Google put out like an algorithm change, like maybe about 10 years ago with like Panda or something. Yeah. And literally like basically 50% of SEO agencies just evaporate overnight in the UK. I don't know what it's like, I'm sure it's very similar internationally, but it was like, like the level to which we adapt to these new tools. I mean, yeah, like, you'd, like if you want, if you were trying, if you were trying to tell someone how to make a good e-com career in 2025, you'd say probably you want to learn resilience, being good at new tools, being generally kind of up to date and kind of being interacting with the community, you'd probably say learn Photoshop. Photoshop would be pretty, Photoshop's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like someone at some point, even with AI, is gonna need to slap some text onto an image quite quickly mm -hmm. and throw it at the Facebook black box. Like, I just think that like the idea that we're like, that this is a, like, we're not, e-commerce e is not really in crisis. We just need like, this is, this is just how it's gonna be now, right? Like in two years time, we'll be worried about a whole new thing. This is just gonna continually have to reinvent itself. And I think we'll find that there are there will be brands that aren't meant for e-com and there'll be brands that are really made for e-com yeah. mm. because, you know, some of our brands, especially within like fashion and so on, are absolutely smashing it still, right? Some new, uh, we've even had some guests on this podcast that are absolutely smashing a D2C strategy, which you might think would be very much a retail B2B type business. So I do think the pure play stuff, as in it's like this idea that I'm an e-com brand and I'm only an e-com brand and I own, you can only buy my product through nine pounds a month subscription, whatever. Like that feels like it's like, that's pretty long dead, right? <laughs> I mean, just in terms of the fact that like the margins that Tesco will offer you are now probably as good, if not better than the margins that you'll be paying to, to Facebook or to TikTok or mm -hmm. someone to acquire these customers. Like, like it's just moved in that, in that. And, and I think that with that said, I think there is something really great about it, right? Like, like you can be 19 and you can set up a little e-commerce site on Shopify on for 29 pounds a month or $35 a month or whatever it is at the moment. And like, you can do this stuff and three months and, and three years later, you can have your stuff in a major supermarket. Like, I think the ability to launch things is still going to be an incredible place for e-com forever where like you can start a business on your own and then you can do that you can make that first fifty thousand pounds make get that like you can do a million pounds a year in revenue before on that one channel alone just by doing something good and communicating it well to people and what does the the future look like for grind can you give us any little uh insider secrets that i mean um, yeah look, i think like look i think that i've i've met, I mentioned earlier about kind of some like international ambitions for this i think like it's a funny one where you look at like where we, we think about like where we, if we want to be a kind of a once in a generation coffee brand right like as in like for a generation of people we'd like to be the way that they drink coffee and that they feel there is something about us that has that resonates with them and that so 
a lot of the time, especially at the point where we kind of we have raised, we've kind of raised quite a lot of money. We've got kind of we've got money in the bank. A lot of the time, it's about looking at like looking at okay, look, what would that business look at? Like if we're the like if we're that if we are that business in 2030, what would that business in 2030 have been doing in 2023? And look, I think that we're probably we've we've got a greater demand internationally that we have supply, and we'd love to do more do more do more out there. I think that like we're going to continue to kind of do work on kind of interesting projects, hopefully while rem remaining kind of both kind of balancing kind of things, that, things that are cool, things that are commercial, like I'd love to get, I'd love to get like an international store, right? I'd love to like, I'd love to do more with kind of international partners and kind of put the, our coffee in places that it isn't currently. Um, but yeah, I think like the cans are really interesting. The cans have like have been incredible success this summer. We had our fridge full of them. They didn't last very long. I've got a few black coffees you really? left. And I think the black, the black coffees and the mochas are generally the last ones to go. The ones in the, the caramel, caramel one, the caramel <laughs> one is like honest. Like, people, we, I think we must sell. I mean, like like the level to which the, the, the caramel sells at a rate to the other ones is absolutely wild. They do taste very good. Uh, I just feel like they're like a little bit naughty in the morning. Oh yeah, I'm, like, I think they're probably a bit like, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> But have you tried? Have you tried like the other like the Starbucks ones? They're like they are. They are. Oh, I'm incredibly sweet. I'm like a proper sugar addict. So yeah. I'm now like stripped sweet out of my diet. And I'm trying to stay oh, away. Really? Once I start, I'm like, give me the Harry. The, Star the Starbucks ones. I'll sell them. I think they sell them in like these like big fridge packs. And I'm like, we had a lot of it lying around the office in Tema. It is like it's like it's so. If you get it on your hands, it's like sticky. It's so it's like little <laughs> double shot. So yeah, yeah, pure they sugar. are like Cans. liquid yeah. sugar. Yeah, They're like pure yeah. and utter sugar. Teddy, Andre, thank you so much for joining me for episode so four. Much for having us. Honestly, I think we've had a really good conversation. I've really enjoyed listening to your insights and views on where you think e-commerce is going and, and how Grind really do take uh, a different approach to D2C strategies. So thank you so much and hopefully we'll have you back on very soon. Great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, guys. I absolutely loved that conversation with one of London's best known coffee brands. I think the insights, the vision for the future of e-commerce is exactly what e-commerce brands need to be doing to evolve with the changing times that we are all facing. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode four. And please do subscribe to us on socials, head over to our website, and we'll be back very soon. Cheers.